Good morning. Welcome to the service of morning prayer at Holy Comforter Episcopal Church. It is Wednesday, January 17th, and we will begin our service with our opening sentence that appears at the top of page 76 of the Book of Common Prayer. Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ and strengthen us in all goodness by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep us in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us together pray by reading the Venite, found on page 82. The Lord has shown forth his glory. Come, let us adore him. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. The Lord has shown forth his glory. Come, let us adore him. Our appointed psalm for today is Psalm 38, verses 1 through 22, which begins on page 636. As we are turning there, I will share with you that we are um, not on YouTube this morning. I have been having technical difficulties in this first section of morning prayer. And so we are only live on Facebook. I apologize for that. Again, we are in Psalm 38 starting on page 636. Let us pray. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger. Do not punish me in your wrath, for your arrows have already pierced me. Your hand presses hard upon me. There is no help in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no soundness in my body because of my sin. For my iniquities overwhelm me. Like a heavy burden, they are too much for me to bear. My wounds stink and fester by reason of my foolishness. I am utterly bound down and prostrate. I go about in mourning all the day long. My loins are filled with searing pain. There is no help in my body. I am utterly numb and crushed. I wail because of the groaning of my heart. O oh Lord, you know all my desires, and my sighing is not hidden from you. My heart is pounding, my strength has failed me, and the brightness in my eyes is gone from me. My friends and companions draw back from my affliction. My neighbors stand far off. Those who seek after my life lay snares for me. Those who strive to hurt me speak of my ruin and plot treachery all the day long. But I am like the deaf who do not hear, like those who are mute and do not open their mouth. 
I have become like one who does not hear, and from one whose mouth comes no defense. For in you, O Lord, have I fixed my hope. You will answer me, O Lord my God. For I said, do not let them rejoice at my expense. For those who gloat over me when my foot slips, truly I am on the verge of falling, and my pain is always with me. I will confess my iniquity and be sorry for my sin. Those who are my enemies without cause are mighty, and many in number are those who wrongfully hate me. Those who repay evil for good slander me, because I follow the course that is right. O Lord, do not forsake me. Be not far from me, O my God. Make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our first reading today comes from the book of Genesis, beginning in the ninth chapter, verse 18 through verse 29. The sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was peopled. Noah, a man of the soil, was the first to plant a vineyard. He drank some of the wine and became drunk, and he lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, lowest of slaves shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed by the Lord my God be Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. May God make space for Japheth, and let him live in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Let us together pray by reading Canticle 11, the third song of Isaiah, which begins on page 87. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. For behold, darkness covers the land, deep gloom enshrouds the peoples. But over you the Lord will rise, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will stream to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawning. Your gates will always be open. By day or by night they will never be shut. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Violence will no more be heard in your land, ruin or destruction within your borders. You will call your walls salvation and all your portals praise. The sun will no more be your light by day. By night you will not need the brightness of the moon. The Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning and will be now and forever. Amen. Our gospel reading is from the book of John, chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. Excuse me. Thank you. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he spent some time there with them and baptized. John also was baptizing at Anan near Salem, because the water was abundant there, and people kept coming and were being baptized. John, of course, had not yet been thrown into prison. 
Now a discussion about purification arose between John's disciple and a Jew. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the one who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you testified, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, No one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. For this reason my joy has been fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, yet no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted his testimony has certified this, that God is true. He whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has placed all things in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the Son will not see life, but must endure God's wrath. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Well, in all honesty, I could have taken the easy path this morning and shied away from the first lesson, and that would have been a more um, PG rating way to start our Wednesday out with, but that may not be the most formative path for us, and it's certainly not realistic in the life that we live today and probably not realistic in the life of Noah and his sons as we see it. This is really, to me, one of the most God-breathed aspects of the Word, the living Word, is that it lives and speaks in every era that it exists within. So I want to lay a foundation on today's scripture commentary. Um, as you heard in the, in the first lesson reading, um, we are in the proverbial adult <laughs> swim end of the pool. And so if you happen to be participating today in our um, morning prayer within the earshot of any beloved little ones, um, this is one of those be careful little ears what you hear moments. And so you might want to, um, when you have the opportunity, fast forward to when we move to our creed, the Apostles' Creed together. Okay, so that being said, this is one of those times I'm going to back up a bit and remind us of the things that we feel that we know. So in chapter 6 of Genesis, Noah was described as a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. So Noah was the one that the protection and the propagation of all life um, during, during what was coming, during the flood that was coming, everything could hinge on Noah because he walked faithfully with God. That was the description. So now we see, now that we've come over into our reading from this morning, now that he doesn't have the great big project uh, given from God of ark building and <laughs> preparing all the things that needed to be prepared, to get flood ready, Noah pivots and apparently has become a vintner. So consider that that process is not quick. Um, vine growing, wine making, etc. it takes years. So it would appear that over that year's period, um, he acquired a taste, right? Um, we don't know if he had a taste for wine in the pre-flood era, but we know he was righteous. Um, so what he does now is in this telling, he does, and we have an episode where he over imbibes. So the great man of God, the one that walked faithfully, is, as we would kind of describe it, hammered. Um, and however it transpired, um, when we have details that aren't in there, it means they're just not relevant, right? 
He's now in his tent uncovered. And what we have in our lesson, and Ham, the father of Canaan, so the fact that he's the father of Canaan is super relevant, and we're going to touch on that in a moment. He saw the nakedness of his father. So 2024, in our hearing of the lesson, um, social mores being what they are, seeing a parent or an elder uncovered, well, that might be uncomfortable, um, particularly if it was drunkenness that got them in that situation. But to us, this might not be significantly, you know, significant event, significant offense. Unfortunate, maybe, um, but it, it obviously is significant here. But we aren't from the ancient Middle East, and so the culture and language can escape us in times like this. And this is an important in that this is not the only use of this phrase in the Hebrew Bible. So we can look at those others and learn and, and gain more of an insight of what is being referenced here. So if we go over to Exodus 20:26, 20, um, there is a reference where the Israelites are prohibited from ascending to the altar on steps so that their nakedness is not uncovered. Forgive the way I pronounce that because I'm Alabamian. There's always some sort of twang in that. In that instance, I want you to think about, we need to think about what would happen if a traditional kilt wearer, <laughs> different uh, 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 anthropologic uh, kind of era, but if a traditional kilt wearer took a long walk up a flight of steps, there would be things that would be seen, right? And, and this is a prohibition of approaching the altar up steps for the same reason, so that their nakedness was not uncovered. Now, in Leviticus 2011, it equates the act of a man who takes the wife of his father, takes, knows, lies with, it lies with his father's wife, as uncovering the nakedness of his father. That is, a, that is a euphemistic term. So incidentally, the sentence for that event is death for both parties involved, whether consent was involved or not. So consensual relationship between the two, non-consensual relationship between the two, um, where the woman had no agency, the sentence would be death for both. So we can see that that terminology is not simply that he was uncovered in his tent. It's the subsequent terminology of, of he uncovered the nakedness of his father. So the bottom line is this. We don't know. We don't know what happened in that tent. We do know because of the reaction that comes, it was not good. So interpreted in the very least, what Ham did to Noah in their culture would have been looked at as dishonoring of his father. In the most significant, it would have been an absolutely evil act perpetuated on a family member, an, an elder family member, either Noah or his wife. And to further this, let's call it what it is. It's sin. Remember last week we were in BCP, page 848. Sin was as follows following our own will instead of the will of God. We're centered on ourselves instead of God, and then therefore we distort a relationship either with God, with people, or with creation. So yes, absolutely an act of sin. So finally, at the point that he goes, not only does he do this, but he goes and tells his brothers, right? So at the point that he goes and tells his brothers, finally, we have a respectful handling of the situation. There's a setting right of the situation. There's a restoration of Noah's dignity. And in turn, a father can again take his rightful place and his prerogative in blessing and cursing. The two sides of that. We've talked about that before, when blessings come and when cursings come. So I want to touch on a few important things here in, in landing, landing this lesson. In these, 
the blessings of Shem and Japheth and the curse, Ham is never mentioned again. We then move to the next generation to his son Canaan and we'll see that this sin, so the sin of Ham obliterated the relationship between them. The resulting people group, generationally the resulting people group, the Canaanites, and we've talked about this, they become one of the most um, debauched in history and ultimately we know through biblical history they are wiped out. It makes me think, that scenario makes me think of Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy, and, and this is uh, in your hearing, I'm sure that this is something that, that um, you have come to in the word before as well. In it, God's addressing actually idolatry, but likely, uh, you know, you'll see the similarities. So this is in Deuteronomy 5, verses 8 and 9. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commands. So this is an incredibly beautiful and comforting meditation for us. Showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commands thousand versus three to four. Love outruns sin any day. Now I know at times we as Christians, we tend to tilt towards or, or have more familiarity or be more in the New Testament. But as with today's Genesis lesson, we find that some of our Hebrew Bible readings, um, they can be foreign, uh, even shocking. But let us not forget that on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. And so, as I said in the beginning, this is one of the miraculous pieces of scripture for me, the way that it continues to live and speak even today. Thanks be to God. Let us together join in the Apostles' Creed found on page 96. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We will pray suffrages A. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon the earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needs needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Today's collect is on page 215. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, 
illumined by your word and sacraments may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshiped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Collect for guidance. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of life we may not forget you, but remember we are ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A prayer for mission. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hardwood of the cross so that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. At this time, I would ask the church to offer your prayers. I do not see any in our live chat. Oh, I see. I do see one in our live chat. We are lifting prayers for Bob and Becky. Thank you. We will also continue to lift in prayer from yesterday, Jerry. For those of you who are lifting the prayer needs found in our weekly service bulletin, we pray for our sick, Celeste, Elaine, Roger, David, Walter, May, Cynthia, Lee, Bonnie, Herb, Rhonda, Chris, Joe, Linda, Pat, Marcy, Linda, pray for Kathleen, Lisa, Melissa, Beth, Gavin, we rejoice in prayer for the gift of those celebrating birthdays, Martha, Roger, and Alpha. We pray and join the celebrations of those celebrating their anniversary. Bill and Jeannie and Jason and Corinne. We pray for our church, our vestry, our staff and clergy, and for all of our upcoming events. We pray for Holy Comforter Episcopal School, for their students, for their teachers, for their staff and administration that care for them so well. We pray for all the local parishes, for their clergy and staff here in Tallahassee. We pray for the Diocese of Florida and also for the Church Universal. Let us together join in the general thanksgiving found on page 101. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. A prayer of St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. I'd like to pray the prayer of peace found on page 8, 8 15. Eternal God, in whose perfect kingdom no sword is drawn but the sword of righteousness, no strength known but the strength of love, so mightily spread abroad your spirit that all peoples may be gathered under the banner of the Prince of Peace as children of one Father, to whom be dominion and glory now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Y'all have a great day. Spread the light and be the church.